501c3 Convergence Fellowship of Churches, ministry, ministry leaders. It's committed to healing, sending and invoking the family decline, preparing the breach, and rebuilding the family from the local church and national We are committed to equipping pastors and ministry leaders with tools designed to address the physical, emotional, and spiritual health interests, needs, rights, and welfare of the family. We enable the local church to serve the family, strengthen the marriage, build relationships, and raise the standard of excellent parenting. Our challenge is to develop generational leaders anchored in the Word of God. So we envision bishops equipped to serve the family as a kingdom priority in the local church internationally. Our mission is to equip bishops Serve the family as a kingdom priority in the local church, internationally. Our objective here is to make sure that everything is lined up vertically so that we're all on the same page, going in the same direction. I'd like you to stand with me as we look on page number three and do our call to worship together. I will serve as a leader. I like that role. And you will be We are the Family Life International Fellowship. We are in the of Christ and the families of high faith, learning the truth, living the free, serving one another, the only words to come down. Our mission is to develop Christ centered families of high integrity. We work to save the lost, educate the saved, live bravely and educate, serve their as we know Jesus better, his divine power gives us everything we need for living a godly life. He has called us to receive his own glory and goodness. I believe in one God, the Father, God, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten.
Bishop's Leadership Retreat. We are already starting at the right level and it goes higher over here. Uh, for introductions, let's sort of go around the room. I realize that more coming, but let's just deal with what we already have here. Let's start with me and then we'll go around. Now let's start with, with uh, uh, Bishop A.T. and Bishop Rosemary. Okay. Um, I'm A.T. Lance. Pastor in Atlanta, uh, Family Life Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And I am Bishop Rosemary Lance, Executive Pastor of Family Life Missionary Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm Bishop Joseph Rambo, the presiding Bishop of Family Life Missionary Baptist Church. I'm also the general pastor of Holy Bishop. I'm Reverend Sam Kofi, Pastor of Gospel and Chapel International, Ghana and New York, new to the family. Praise God. My name is Bishop Richard Lands. I serve here uh, under the leadership of our Archbishop, Dr. Sterling Lands, as well as pastor of a Beta Care Ministry here at Greater Calvary Bible Church. Bishop Christopher Sterling Lands, um, one of the associate pastors here at Great Calvary. Uh, I serve as the pastor of the Alpha Care Ministry uh, and as well as over our expansion ministry uh, here at Great Calvary. Bishop Ian Maurice Humans, I serve here at Great Calvary. I'm also the pastor of the Omega House Ministries here in Austin, Texas. Amen. My name is Bishop Anthony Wright, church planner in Houston. Family Life Missionary Church, amen. And also General Secretary of Family Life International Fellowship. Amen. 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 And I'm Sterling Lands. I serve as the presiding premier of Family Life International Fellowship. And I also serve as the senior pastor at our host church, which is Great God. It's good to have you here. Great God. Amen. We've got Georgia in the house, Houston in the house, Nigeria in the house. Ghana, New York in the house. Yeah. Uh, just a quickie, uh, I, I did not know uh, Pastor Coffee uh, in, in the past. I recognized the name from something that I'd seen uh, some time back, but he introduced himself by name drop. This is what he said. I'm the son of Bishop Heaven. <laughs> That's all he had to say. Once he said that, the like, door was quiet. Yeah. So you got to know. You have to say in the name yeah. of right. Jesus, because God recognizes right. the name. If you don't have the right name, Amen. then you don't get in the door. So right. we're pleased that you're all here Amen. on this day. Um, we're going to bring up then our, our featured facilitator for today uh, to get us started, and that's Bishop Anthony Wright, who will talk about developing generational leaders. And this is phase one, and we introductory to the rest of what we're going to be doing for these next several days. Bishop Wright? Yes, sir. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Yes, I do have a handout for you. This is for, thank you, sir. This is for your reference uh, so that you are equipped Amen. After we leave the session for some tools that you can use to equip your leaders and your members and to guard yourselves. Amen. We face some dire times. So uh, let's just start off by looking at some of the latest statistics and then we'll go into our general topic today. So one of the good things is that they say that 90% of pastors feel they're called and in the place where God called them. However, 80% of people in pastoral ministry believe that they have, it has negatively affected their families. 23% of pastors report being distant to their family. 24% of pastors' families resent the church for its effect on the family. 95% of pastors report not praying 
daily or regularly with their spouse. 50% or 57% of pastors are unable to pay their bills. 80% of pastors expect conflict in their church. 35% of pastors battle with depression or, or, or fear. 35% of pastors battle with depression or fear of inadequacy. 70% of pastors do not have a close friend. And over 50% of pastors are unhealthy, overweight, and do not exercise. And only one out of 10 pastors will retire as a pastor. So as we start, we want to have some real talk, amen? Amen, amen. amen. God, when he called us, he didn't say it's going to be a bed of roses, right. amen? Oftentimes, we get into the ministry, we jump in head first, and we think that because God called us, because we have such a strong unction, it's going to go easy, and all the time it doesn't. <laughs> and the question is, when it doesn't, who do you turn to? How are you going to respond? What are you going to, are you going to quit? Amen. So we see a lot of people quit. As a matter of fact, uh, this lesson is, is derived from some uh, of the latest leadership emergence research, biblical research that has been done over the past 25 years. Over 3,000 case studies, both biblical, historical, and contemporary leaders. And what they find is that, number one, few leaders finish well. Number two, leadership is difficult. It's hard. <laughs> Amen. You ever uh, encounter someone who professes their call to the ministry and you just, you wonder if they know what they're in for. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Leadership is difficult. Number three, God's enabling presence is the essential ingredient for successful leadership. And number four, spiritual leadership can make a difference. Amen. In other words, the way to say that is you need the Holy Ghost. Yeah. Right. Amen. So the premise of our talk today is we're going to talk about the circle of accountability. Because we are facing such uh, dire straits, because we are facing such challenging times, I want to encourage you that you can't do it by yourself. Amen. Every pastor needs a pastor. I'm not the first one to say that. Amen. Right. We need to be cold. Uh, mentoring each other, encouraging each other, building each other up. We need to have real conversations. We need to be praying for each other. We need to be holding each other accountable. And then we can focus on the next generation. Amen. So I'm, uh, I'm very appreciative of, of Archbishop for giving me the opportunity to set the tenor of our conversation. Because if we're going to raise the next generation of leaders, we got to take care of ourselves. Amen. We need to model the unity of the believers here among ourselves. Yeah. We need to hold each other up. Amen. Like, like uh, Moses has been and, and her holding his arms up. Aaron and, and her holding his arms up. And as long as he's, his arms were held up, they had the victory. So you have to circle yourself with some spirit-filled leaders. A circle of accountability is what I call it. Amen? So that you can fight this fight and raise up the next generation. Alright, so first question I want to ask. What does it mean to finish well? When you say most leaders don't finish well, what are you saying? What does that mean? Alright, so you have this on your uh, first sheet. It has six characteristics of leaders who finish well. So what I'm going to do is I want to introduce it define it, and then if I can get a volunteer to read the example, that would be great. We can have a, a very interactive discussion here. And if you, if you are reminded or peaked about a leader who you have in mind, who you can reference, then share that uh, for the fruit of our discussion. Amen? So the first one is an intimacy with God. They maintain a personal, vibrant relationship with God right up to the end. Amen? So I don't know if any of you run track, but when you when the gun goes off, you got to have in mind that I'm going to finish the race. <laughs> I didn't start this race to quit. I didn't start the race to get disqualified. I didn't start the race to give up. No matter if I get a cramp, no matter if somebody pushed me, no matter if I fall down, I'm going to get up and finish. Amen? So the first one is intimacy with God. Can I get somebody to read that example? They maintain a personal, vibrant relationship with 
guy right up to the end. Example, Daniel, Daniel, 12, 13, and as for you, go your way until the end. You will rest, and then at the end of the day, you will rise again to receive the inheritance set aside for you. So Daniel finished the race with great hope of a life lived well. Amen. Number two, is there lifelong learners? They maintain a learning posture and can learn from various kinds of sources, especially life. Somebody read that example about David. They maintain a learning posture and can learn from various kinds of sources, life especially. Example, David, Psalms 37 and 25. Once I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen the godly abandoned the children begging for Amen. So David learned. There are some times when it got difficult, but he saw the faithfulness of God through those difficult times. And he can tell everybody at the end, look, I've been through some difficult times, but God has brought us through it. Amen. So you are a lifelong learner. Number three is you, you experience the fruit of the Spirit. So I'm going to read that example. They manifest Christ's likeness in character as evidenced by the fruit of the Spirit in their lives. Example, Paul, 2 Timothy 3.10. But you, Timothy, certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know how much persecution and suffering I have endured. You know all about how I was persecuted in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, but the Lord rescued me from all of it. Amen. Paul could look back and tell Timothy, look, I've been consistent. You know me. You've seen what I've gone through. You've seen me exercise my faith in good and bad times. Amen. So that's the fruit of the Spirit, the endurance, the patience. Amen. The joy. Number four is a life of conviction. Can I have a volunteer read life of conviction? Truth is lived out in their lives so that the conviction and promises of God are seen to the earth. Example, Joshua and Joshua are very important. Soon, I will die. Go in the way of everything and else. Put it in your hearts, you know that every promise of the Lord, you are God, has come to. Not a single word has heard. Look at that. Mm -hmm. Joshua finished strong. And he was able to say to the people who he was leaving behind that God is faithful to his promises. <laughs> yeah. He had a life of conviction. It was proved out over his life to where he could stand and testify in the face of death. God is faithful. Amen. Number five, you want to leave a legacy. Someone read that for us. In the denied one or more ultimate controls. Example, Josiah's second case chapter 23, verse 25. Never before have they been a king like Josiah, who taught the Lord with all his heart and soul as he turns, obeying all the laws of Moses. And there has never been a king that came since. Amen. What are you going to be known for? What's going to be your legacy? Amen. Each of us has given a personal, a personal account to God. You have to have your focus on how you're going to finish. What is it going to be? What are people going to know you for? What's going to be your contribution to the kingdom of God? Walking into eternity. Amen. And number six. A sense of destiny. Can I get a volunteer to read, read that? They walk with a growing awareness of a sense of destiny and see some or all of it fulfilled. Example, Joshua, Joshua 24, 25. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day at Shechem, committing them to follow the degrees and regulations of the Lord. Joshua recorded these things in the book of God's instructions. As a reminder of their agreement, he took a huge stone and rolled it beneath the terrorist tree beside the tabernacle of the Lord. So Joshua it was, was in his old age, but yet he charged.
after I leave, and you are going to have to be faithful in this situation. So you look at the top verse there, it says Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 8, is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, finishing is better than starting. It's great that you've been called to ministry. It's great that you uh, embarked out on a, a work for God. It's great that you started, but will you finish well? Amen? All right, so we, we just get started. We have some real talk. How am I going to finish? Well, let's first just say this. I will finish well. Uh -huh. I will finish well. I will finish well. All right, that's where we're going. That's where we're going. Now, the next question is, what are the potential pitfalls that derail leaders from finishing well? We want to finish well. We say we're going to finish well. But there's six potential pitfalls that potentially will prevent us from finishing well. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul told Timothy, he said, you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. And in verse uh, 5 of chapter 4, he says, you should keep a clear mind in every situation. Don't be afraid of suffering for the Lord. Work at telling others the good news and fully carry out the ministry God has given you. So I take, I take a lot of comfort in that. So I don't get caught up in a comparison game because God puts in my hands what he wants me to do. And so it's my job to be faithful That's in that. Whether it's one, two, or 10,000. Amen. When Moses broke up the leaders, some had 1,000, some had 50, some had five. Yeah. The question is, will you be faithful in what God has given you? So there's six barriers that we have to worry about. Six barriers that we want to put on our radar and watch out for. Okay, this is how we're going to do this. I'm going to read the, the title, and then I'm going to give you the definition, and then I want you to start at the biblical exam. Can we? <laughs> Amen. We'll have a little uh, interactive here. So there's six of them. There's finances, power, pride, illicit sex, family issues, and plateauing. The first one is finances. Greed and indiscretion in the trust of handling finances can cause a leader to fail. Can I get a volunteer to read that biblical example? Biblical example, Judas, John 12, verses 4 through 6. But Judas is scared. The disciple will soon betray him said that perfume was worth a year's wages. It should have been sold and the money given to the poor. Not that he cared for the poor, he was a thief, and since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. If you have greed in your heart and indiscretion with fighting, you're not going to finish well. All right. You're going to fall. So this is a, a gut check time for us. We need to check ourselves. Number two is, is power. As a leader, exercising power is a necessity. But with the lack of accountability and humility, power can be abused and cause the leader to fall. Can I get a volunteer? Give me an example. Isaiah, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. But when he had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering the sanctuary of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. As a rider, the high priest went in after him with any other priest of the Lord, all brave men. They confronted King Uzziah and said, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the word of the priests alone. The descendants of Aaron, who was set apart for this world. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned. The Lord God will not honor you for this. Oh my goodness. I wish we had 80 brave Republicans who could go into the White House. <laughs> well, get out. <laughs> And the heart of a leader can cause a leader to fall. Yes. Someone read that example. Biblical example. King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel 429 32. 
Twelve months later, he was taken to walk on that flat roof of the, roof of the royal palace in Babylon. As he looked out across the city, he said, Look at this great city of Babylon. By my own mighty power, I have built this beautiful city as my royal residence to display my majestic splendor. While these words were still in his mouth, a voice called down from heaven, O King, King Nebuchadnezzar, this message is for you. You are no longer ruler of this kingdom. You will be driven from human society. You will live in the fields with the wild animals, and you will eat grass like a cow. Seven periods of time will pass while you live this way, until you learn that the most high rules over the kingdoms of the world and give them to anyone he chooses. These are our slippery slopes for us. Number four is illicit sex. It's not marital sex. Marital sex is good. Marital sex is healthy. Marital sex is a gift. Amen. Marital sex is productive and it reproduces uh, children. It's a blessing. It, it keeps the, the, the marriage together. But illicit sex, personal indiscretions and private extramarital affairs and illicit sexual, sometimes emotional relationships can cause the leader to fall. Can I give a volunteer to read that example? Biblical example, King Solomon. 1 Kings 11, 1 and 4. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women. Besides Pharaoh's daughter, he married women from Moab, Ammon, Edom, Sidon, and from among the Hittites. Two, the Lord had clearly instructed the people of Israel you must not marry them because they will turn your hearts to their gods. Yet Solomon insisted on loving them anyway. Three, he had 700 wives of royal birth oh my God. and 300 concubines. And in fact, they did turn his heart away from the Lord. Four, in Solomon's old age, they turned his heart to worship other gods instead of being completely faithful to the Lord his God as his father David had been. Number five is family issues. Problems between spouses or between parents and children or between siblings can destroy a leader's ministry. Someone read that example for us.
not cubic. Amen. So there's, we, we've seen two examples, leaders who finish well and leaders who fail to finish well. Both were strong leaders. Both sets are strong leaders. Kings, prophets, disciples, people who walk with Jesus, but they did not finish well. And the Lord is engaged with all of them. The Lord told Solomon, don't love those women. Yes. Don't love those, those uh, Hittites. <laughs> Amen. He told them his heart was set on loving them anyway. Jesus confronted Judas and gave him a chance to repent. And he chose to sell them for 30 pieces of silver. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So God was engaged with these leaders. They had a chance to be accountable, but they chose not to. So this is a, a charge to us, amen? Amen. So I want to present to you now this concept of the circle of accountability, amen? So you're surrounding yourself with mentors and co-mentors, both internal and external to your operations, and then uh, folks who you're discipling and leaving a legacy to. Because of the inherent threat that we face as leaders, it's imperative that we Establish a relational circle of accountability. Folk who know us, folk who are okay with calling us to account, folk who will will uh, check us, stop us in our tracks, give us a chance to finish well, right? And there's a challenge here because if you don't have a circle, then you expose. You're on your own, and the enemy can have his his way with you. Whereas if you surround yourself with spirit filled Folk who can keep you accountable, the enemy can't get to you. Amen? You're guarded. <laughs> You're protected. See how the model works. Amen? So it starts uh, with the mentor. Now, this could be a pastor. It could be a, a senior uh, a, a minister who you run into, and he just has a divine uh, uh, engagement with you and drop a word in your spirit. All right, there's different levels uh, to this, but the, the mentor is going to give you strategic vision. He's going to give you spiritual guidance, and he's going to provide authority and covering for you. Amen? And then on either side, you have co-mentors. You have uh, some mentors who you can be confidential with, who you can ask to pray, man, I'm really struggling with. And, and I encourage you to be proactive in this. Man, brother, I'm struggling with this area of my life. Man, I'm having these difficult. Will you pray for me? Will you, well, can we just read the Bible together? Can we talk through this? So you have some that are internal. They're in the mix with you. They see you every day. They can see the look on your face. They can tell if you had an argument at home. They can tell if you're slipping. If, you, if you're going back on, on if you're falling off the wagon, as they say. Amen? And they can give you encouragement. Then you have uh, external co-mentors. And these are folk who, like in our fellowship, we might not see each other for a year, but when you see me, you're going to check me. <laughs> and you might just ask, right, how's uh, Sister Wright doing? Yeah. And, if, and if I got a chance to come clean. If she's not doing right, I can ask. I can say, hey, you know, we have some problems. We need to get to real talk. Amen? And they give you uh, some objectivity. And you say, well, I'm having some problems. Look, God is faithful. God is going to keep you. It might be tough, but it's going to be all right. Hold on, I'm going to pray for you right now. <laughs> Amen. They give you some objectivity. So you don't give up. So you don't just fall into depression. They won't let you hang your head. Y'all seen that meme where the guy's playing basketball, he's got his head down, and his, uh, his uh, teammate comes up, you know, man, pick your head up. They come along and they encourage you. And then we have the next generation. We are leaving a legacy, a legacy perspective. And it's our charge to be consistent. Because they're watching to see if we practice what we preach. They're watching to see if we're the same on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And then they give us a sense of renewal. We remember what it was like to be young in the ministry. They give us a sense of, of, of purpose and hope of what's going to carry on in the next generation. We surround ourselves like this. We're active like this. It gives us balance. balance. It's all about balance. Balance of your life and your ministry. Because it's not all just about the ministry. The life of the leader undergirds his ministry. Amen? So one of the chief qualifications is, is your home. That's right. So there's, there's got to be balance between the two. 
So there's the model. You have a relational circle of mentors, peers, and disciples so that we can raise up the next generation. We have a balance of our life and ministry. We need different kinds of relationships to bring a balance to our life and our ministry. Now, what happens when you get imbalanced? This is the next page. What does a leader who is imbalanced look like? Well, you got somebody who has nobody. He don't have no mentor, no pastor. He doesn't have any uh, co-laborers who he engages with. Nobody praying for him. Nobody holding him accountable. Nobody giving him a, a sense of objectivity. Nobody giving him a sense that you're not the, the first one to go in this rodeo. And then nobody he's pouring into. So that's a, a lone wolf. And the problem with the, the lone wolf is there's no accountability and he's at a high risk of failing and burnout. The next one we have here is the elitist. The elitist don't want to listen to nobody. He doesn't have any objectivity poured into his life and he ain't no good to nobody else. And he's just dealing with, you know, the other doctors and lawyers having good church talk. But he's an elitist. And his, his ongoing relationships are the only focus that he has is people in parachurch organizations. Amen. We don't have any, any, any purpose. They're just having a good time. The third one here is the authoritarian. And the authoritarian uh, doesn't have anyone who's holding him accountable. Uh, there's no co-mentoring, co-encouragement uh, uh, or objectivity going on. He's just leading and, and exercising strong directive guidance. And so he becomes insensitive to feedback. And conflict is common and often repeated in the next generation. This last one is the politician. The politician is just pushing for position. He's just there to try to get a title. So he's really not, really not engaging in any meaningful ministry. There's no external relationships. And he has a very limited perspective. It's all about having his name on the road in a certain position. Amen. Now, I do want to tell y'all a story because one of the things in preparing this material that really uh, enriched me is I thought about the 18 years I spent sitting here under uh, Archbishop Lane. And I'll, I'll tell you this. When we started the Episcopal process, now I can say this because I was, I was at ground zero. Amen? I saw the dynamic that happened when Archbishop opened his circle. And other archbishops came and, and other ministers of the Episcopal. He changed. He, he matured. He used to be just focused on Austin. Now he's got a global focus. He used to just be focused on, on the here and now. Now he's got a generational focus. I, I saw that evolve. I saw that happen right before my eyes. So, I mean, he's the best example I could give of, of balance. Amen. want to talk about balance. I've seen it myself. It, 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 it blessed me. I try to tell other people, look, you, you understand what this man has gone through. I've seen it. See the change. Yes. So, amen. <laughs> I'm just, just passing that on. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 11 says, so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. We need to keep doing this. Amen. We need to be faithful to encourage each other. We need to be faithful to hold each other accountable. We need to be faithful in the work because there's a, a, a legacy that we want to leave. Now, I think I got one more thing left. I do. This is my last thing. What does, or what is your destiny as a leader? Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verse 10 says, Everything has already been decided. It was no long ago what each person would be. So there's no use arguing with God about your destiny. Oh, so God is the one who's determined. Yeah, you're God's workmanship. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. God has a purpose for you in the kingdom. And it's, it is his good pleasure to plant you and to set you where he wants you to be. Amen? So when that's the case, now you can, you can uh, focus, right? And get about the business of being faithful, amen, to fulfilling your, your destiny. Amen? You ain't got to make it up. You ain't got to fight for it. You ain't got to uh, uh, steal it from somebody else. It's yours. God purposed in you something that nobody can take away from you. It's yours. 
You just have to be faithful. So there's a list here. Number one is a saint. A saint is a model life that others want to emulate. A shepherd, uh, a ministry model that others want to emulate. Family, a God-fearing family, leaving behind children who will walk with God and carry on a godly heritage. Now, there, you can have one or a few of these, so I encourage you to check a box off if it resonates with you. So you can see, oh man, this, this is what God has given me. This, I got five boxes checked. I got seven boxes checked. Number four, pastor. An extensive personal ministry. The end product has changed lives. Number five, preacher. An extensive public ministry. The end product has changed lives. Number six, a pioneer who starts new works for God. End products are new churches, new movements, and new works for God. Number seven is a social activist. Those who correct wrongs. Who end, uh, end products are changed institutions, societies, and so on that reflect justice, fairness, and so on. Number eight is an artist. Those who introduce creative ways of doing things. End products are whatever is created as well as a model for how to do things differently. Number nine is a founder. A special category of a pioneer who starts a new Christian organization and the end product uh, is the organization. Number 10 is a, a stabilizer. Those who work in churches, movements, and other organizations to improve them and keep them alive and consistent. The end product is the, the revitalized and efficient organization. Number 11 is a researcher. Those who find out ways uh, or find out why things happen the way that they do in Christian endeavors. The end product is an understanding of the dynamics of things that can help others in Christian work. Number 12 is writers, those who capture ideas and writing in order to help others in Christian work. End product is the writing that is produced. And then number 13 is promoters, those who can motivate others and inspire them to use ideation, to join movements and so on. And the product, the end product is people committing themselves to new Ventures. So you may not be able to choose your destiny, but you can choose to be faithful. Amen. That's the choice before us. As we look at developing generational leaders, we want to gird ourselves, we want to encourage each other, we want to uh, keep each other accountable, and then we want to be focused on finishing well. Amen. So just by way of review, we looked at uh, some of the, the current issues that are facing leaders today in pastoral ministry. We looked at uh, uh, what it means to finish well. We looked at why people don't finish well. We looked at what it means to surround yourself with spirit-filled believers, uh, mentors, peers, and disciples who you can uh, uh, show the way and pass on your faith. And then we looked at what it, the end result is going to be. What is the, the destiny that God has placed in your bosom to nurture and care for and to produce? Amen? So... There you have it. Now, do we have any questions, comments, discussion? Yes, sir. One of the things that uh, we bless about this fellowship is that well, we get a circle up. Um, we don't, we're not good at bishop talk. And what I mean is the colloquial bishop talk. Right. Um, bless that we, we deal real.
watch who you surround yourself with. Right? We can have uh, hundreds of Facebook friends, but they not really know what's going on in our lives and hold us accountable. You need a handful of people who are around you to mentor you, to, to encourage you, to hold you accountable, and, and then to pour into. God wants us, God wants to pour into us, and often he does that through other people. Amen. So I, I didn't want to mark this, I didn't want to put this up here and not mark it up. You know, you know, 
wrong, you know? We don't have time for, for the mess. Right? They, people self-select themselves all the time. They make up excuses why they can't do what they want to do. I so, think to, uh, to be a good mentor, you have to first learn how to be mentor. Yes, sir. So that will allow, uh, when, you, when you start allowing people to come into your circle of accountability, you will probably, if you have that attitude, it will help you to move beyond unauthorized voices. Okay? Yes, sir. Good. Oh. Because yes, sir. that's where the enemy gets in and get folks off track. Right. Just because a person looks a certain way and they say this stuff, don't mean that they ought to be speaking to you. Yes, sir. You see, the enemy uses carriers like that in order to undercut God's process. Yes. The circle is God's process. Yes, sir. You know, He never wanted us to navigate these waters by ourselves. Yes, sir. And so we all need to be accountable to somebody. At the end of the day, yes, sir. We know one of man's greatest issues, right, is submitting to another man. Yes, sir. Okay. But when he does, and it's the right one, it's the right voice. He soar like me. Yes, sir. Yeah. And I'm too, I agree with you with Archbishop. He's spoken into my life. Yes, sir. And I just have to tilt my head. And I appreciate yes. you so much yes, for the sacrifice that he made early on. I don't, I don't know how engaged he was with the Spirit. I just know that he was obedient. Yes, and because of that, I have myself as some citizens who owe him a great debt of gratitude. Do you want to shout for that? Do you want to shout for that? Absolutely. So there's, there's a time element to this as well. When we start off, we start off down here with the cycle. We're getting poured into. And it, and it happens this way. And as we progress in age, we get to where we can. And so here, it's very direct. You don't need a lot of folk in putting into your life when you're really young. When you get mature, now you can. You know, you, you know you have this spiritual authority giving you strategic direction. These give you encouragement. These hold you accountable. And then over time, you, you attain to this place where now God has seen fit in your, your walk to be a mentor more to the younger generation. So the model works. We, we just have to be very careful. And, and you do have to be careful with who's on your, your right and your left. <laughs> so, uh, hey man, I, I, I'm man. We had a chance to talk, talk through that. So, uh, please feel free to use that and you know, put, put people in a box and ask yourself, do I want this guy right here? Do I want Judas right here or but not? <laughs> do, I need, do I need to let him go? Yes, sir. Yeah, Bishop, I need some clarification. Uh, please. Um, finishing where? Yes. You know, um, I want to know uh, what measure do you use, you know, in determining how the minister finish well? Uh, All the time it comes from this. Mm -hmm. Paul said, "Follow me as I follow Christ." So God says, <laughs> "Look, I'm going to show you what it means to finish well. I'm going to give you someone to follow. You're not out here by yourself. You have an example to follow." Uh, I have some issues here. Um, there are some ministers, right? Yeah. Bishops or pastors who want their kids to take over their ministry. Uh -huh. And they realize that no, their kids have their own interests. And then there are others who also see themselves um, ending without having ministry at all. The yeah. ministry is split. Some also growing up realize that. Uh, the ministry is not together. Yeah. You know, and my problem here has to do with if you want your child to pick up your ministry, but it's not showing interest, mm -hmm. and you have the issue where you have a partner who also believes that she has the ability to give ministry, but you realize that it is not there, 
but she also think it's there. Because I have an issue when I'm dealing with, uh, it had to do with the minister who want the son to be a minister to take over from him. But the son is also doing different things you know, together. So the, what the minister did was that he brought out somebody from the outside, trained him, and the person is doing well. But the partner also want to talk about the ministry, but the partner don't have what it takes. Because as she gets to the front line, she ends up scattering the people. Mm -hmm. And this young man from the outside is actually doing well. You know, so uh, I don't know uh, which is which. So I, I think, you know, this relationship here mm -hmm. is a strong guiding factor. So what, what you describe is somebody who doesn't have this. They don't have an authority covering over them. They're just doing it on their own. They're just freestyle. Yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I, I just want to chime in. I think the first thing that needs to be established is whose ministry it is. Is it God's? Mm -hmm. Or is, is it the guy who's making the decisions? And I think once that is established, I think from there, uh, whatever the decisions are, will, will uh, imply whose ministry it belongs to. Because if it's God's, then we go to him. Mm. And we don't, we, we don't get caught up on personalities and bloodlines and all this kind of stuff. Mm. We trust God to pull whomever he desires to lead. Because we're leading his people. Yeah. Mm. And we're, we don't make very good decisions on our own. We, our decisions are biased. They're laced with, uh, with biases. But when we go to God, we surrender our decisions to Him. And He then raises up. It's the same issue that uh, when, when David was, was anointed. It's the same thing when, when, the, when, the, when, the, when the, um, the prophet went over to, to Nathan. It's the same thing. You know, we wanted one of his other boys to be the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And God said, no. None of these. I know you, I hear how you talk about them and all that and what they've done and, and uh, what they can do. And I'm sure they can do all of that. But they are not the ones. As a matter of fact, what I'm looking, what I'm seeking, is this is not something, Daddy, that you can control. This is a God thing. I see the same thing. So he said, no, you got to have somebody else around here somewhere. And then the papa said, yeah, I got a little run out back, out there with the sheep. And then the, the, the prophet said, go get him. Go get him. Well, God is doing the same thing. And I think in this situation, we got to let God, because it's his, it's his church. And sometimes we forget because we are, we're steering and orchestrating and directing and calling the shots. And we forget that this ain't our stuff. This is his. These are not our people. These are his people. And so when we get back to that, then we can start making better decisions. And we can cut down on the fuss. It don't matter uh, if we think one child or the other child should do this and do that and all that. What matters is whether or not we went to God in prayer about the decision. And I'm telling you, he all hits and no misses. He will direct you. Might not be what you like. I don't know how they felt about David being anointed the king over some of his other boys. Uh, the, the, the text doesn't let us behind the curtain. But I'm sure because he didn't bring him up in the first round. I'm sure he felt some kind of way. And he got used to it, but I'm sure initially he didn't think his son had what it took to be king. But God, that was God to sit. And so we, we, we do the same thing. We say this one because this one can do this. As a matter of fact, Moses, when God called Moses to do what he did, he, I can't talk. My brother is so much more diplomatic and articulate. Why don't you just use him? 
and I'll just, I'll just run along. But I said, no, you my guy. But to help you out, we can bring him in too. But you're still my guy. So I think in that situation, we got to get back, got to get back to that. And it might be a, a fuss, it might be a scuffle, it might be a fight in order to go with what God wants. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day. But you got to be willing to fight that fight. Because regardless of how this thing play out, the only thing you want is what God wants. Otherwise, it's your stuff, and your stuff ain't going to do nearly what God's stuff will do. But, like you said, you know, you're the one. 
you know, in this particular ministry for whatever it is that you're supposed to do. So, I just, you know, as he said, we pray, we encourage, you know, we speak to that person. Um, uh, and just let them know what the good news is. Yeah, I, for, for me personally, I know that we all have to give an account for our choices. And oftentimes the reasons we run into problems is because of our own choice. We made the decision to fall into that. You can't blame God for that. But the scripture also says if you are, who are spiritual, restore those who fall. So it, it does take someone to come along and reset the bone so that it can heal and, and retain its original functionality, sometimes even stronger. You know, God uses uh, some of those difficulties that we run to in life to uh, strengthen us. Uh, but in the end, we, we have to give our own account for the choices that we make. And I, I actually went through a situation like that when, uh, you know, I ended up having to go back and, and work to work in 2004. And I was heartbroken because I had been in ministry for three years, full time, you know, uh, but I felt like God just ripped me out. And he, you know, because he knew my family to be taken care of. And my wife's uh, father was on his deathbed. And they called and, and said, Anthony, we want you to come and read him his last rites. And I ended up doing his funeral. And so God brought me back in and, and affirmed in me. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm still with you. I'm still using you. I need you to get to work. <laughs> so, so I've had some situations like that where you know you think that you messed up, you think that you you out of the game. The coach calls in and says, "No, here's the ball. Go we'll get three outs. Yeah, help us win this game." So, um, it, those are those are things that we it just takes wisdom, you know, that we're surrounded with to get through that. And we can see if somebody's genuine, right? We can see if somebody's making excuses. We can see if somebody is is uh, repentant and and uh, remorseful and, and wanting to you know uh, do right by God, or if they're just hard headed and don't even you know and not. And so you know that's their choice. Which so it's, it does take wisdom. It does take the community of, of leaders to help guide folks through this process. We all need your restoration. Will Probably a result of prayer. Yes, sir. You were praying, other folks were praying. That circle of other folks who knew you, who knew your situation, was praying for you. And that God used that process to reestablish you. Yes, sir. And I think it's the same way for any leader who has fallen and slipped away. I think it starts with prayer. I think. We got to trust the process. You know, that's what we teach. That's what we preach. So when it's our turn to lean on it, we yes, got to trust it. We, we know it works. We got to trust it. <laughs> right, right. So if you messed up, if you found yourself on the wrong side of the sheet, right, you check the box on the back side where it was talking about, you know, some difficulty. This is a good time to get right, right? <laughs> we can pray. <laughs> We encourage you because you want to stay in the fight. You don't want to. You don't want to let these things take you out. Uh, it's like we were talking about boxing earlier today. You, you might got beat up. You might got hit with that that right hook. <laughs> yeah. Well, we we gonna, we gonna uh, you know put some salve on it. Give you some water. Spit out the blood. Get back out. Because <laughs> the fight ain't over. You got twelve rounds. To go this All right. Yes, sir. Because God said, hit 
say every time Ole Miss is weak, we got to be able to find something about that leader that says, okay, he may be in a messed up point right now, but doesn't mean he was always there. Was he, was he a real leader? Yeah, somebody going to be a doctor for that leader somewhere. Somewhere. You, you can't find that. Nobody can say anything about it. Perhaps he's self -appointed. Yeah, I, I like what uh, Bishop A.T. said, you know, it's all about what God wants. So if we're in a po posture where we're surrendered to God, now God can, he can move heaven and earth to get you where he wants you to be. So um, I think that's, that's the bottom line. Amen. Grace.
down to those areas that we're vulnerable in. We just don't want to make a mistake, or we, we don't want to we don't want to show our vulnerability. I mean, when, when I say who am I regarding an assignment, am, am, am I not really saying that? Uh, you know, I, I don't believe I can do that. So God answers the question by saying, I, uh -huh. I will be with you. Uh -huh. That's who you are. Now remember, God had already identified himself in the past by saying, I am that I am. So I am. I will be with you. Who will be with me? I am. Yeah. I, I am. You, you, you are what? I mean, I'm whatever you need. I'm your identity. Yes, sir. Think about this. And then there's another question that, that came to mind as you were talking, Bishop Anthony. Uh, not only does a person have to be have to have their identity established, but a person should be informed. You need to hear the word of God, and I love to make this phrase because it drives it deeper into my spirit. Hear the word of God, read the word of God, become the word of God, and practice and obey the word of God. And, I, and that's, that resonates with me sometimes in my sleep. And I, I, I'm thinking, I can wake up thinking of those words because until you get to the point where that becomes a part of who you are, then it's very easy to hear something else. So, so when you get to verse 13, Moses asks another question that is designed to put clarity on God's answer in verse 12. The question is in verse 13. Is anyone there yet? Yes. Read. But Moses protested, if I go to the people of Israel and tell them the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, they won't believe you. They will ask, which God are you talking about? What is his name? Then what should I tell them? So he, he has to be Yes, he needs his identity uh, established, but he also needs to be informed as to exactly who's, who, who's really talking here. See, oftentimes, we get caught up on, on an exciting idea. But did you know that Satan can, can prompt you to do stuff? Mm -hmm. Satan can uh, come up with some fantastic ideas yeah, and prompt you to think they're great, and before you know it, you go to running with that thing and thinking that you're on the right track. But in reality, you didn't stop long enough to find out who was talking. Who was actually talking. So here, he asked a question. I mean, uh, okay, I, I hear you say that I will be with you, but who are you? What, what, what is your name? I mean, the people are going to ask me. I've got to be able to tell them what your name is. I, I need to be informed here. Right? Who, who are, what, what is your name? Informed. And God answers the question in verse 14 and 15. All right. Oh, this was going on right there today if you were talking about it. Amen. 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 Verse, verse 14 and 15. You there? Yes. Someone? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites. Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, have sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. See, if you want, if you want better information, you must ask better questions. And Moses, in his protest, and it wasn't in a sense of protest. It was not a defiance, but it was him uh, admitting to himself that he did not have what he thought he what he thought he needed, and he was trying to find out what was it that God saw that he didn't see. So God never talked to him about what he saw in Moses. That's you notice nowhere in the book does he say this is what I see in you. Instead, God re reminds Moses of who he is. I am who I am. Okay, I'm the one that will be with you. I am who I am. And my pedigree is I am the God of everybody you know. Your fathers. Mm -hmm. so, so you're not the first one. 
Good idea, contact me. So don't, don't think I don't have any experience in doing this. What I'm telling you is that if we're not informed, then we can't inform. So we need, and then there's another item that jumped out at me too. Uh, Moses needed, I believe, needed to establish some credibility. So, so when I looked over here at the fourth chapter of, of that Exodus, verse one, no, 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 uh, yeah, verse one uh, tends to address his credibility need. Someone read that. Hey, then Moses answered, what if they won't believe me and will not obey me, but say, the Lord did not appear to you? So God doesn't get upset with us because we are looking for a way to squirm out, as long as we don't squirm out. Yeah. So, so Moses now, he dealt with the, the identity issue, he's dealt with the being informed issue, but now he's looking for a stamp of credibility. So. How would the people believe that you have sent me? I mean, if I tell them everything you said, what is it that, that will cause them to believe me? A bishop has to be able, and, and of course, I know that you're going to immediately know that this is where I was going all along, but I, I just needed to get here. The bishop must be able to assert that I am who I say I am based on what I went through to get to say that this is who I am. So there are many, many organizations that are manufacturing credentials. You can actually buy uh, credentials online. Right. Yes, you can. You can get them online. There are, there are communions, fellowships, and reformations that are just, they're just interested in people who can spend the money to buy the credentials. Mm -hmm. And so they have to buy the credentials. I have folk uh, on a regular basis trying to see what, 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 what does it cost me to become a bishop in, in uh, family life. And then they're always shocked, generally, when I say that no, we don't, we don't sell credentials. So then the next question, which they were not prepared to answer, is, well, what do I need to do? And the answer to them is always the same, and all of you know the answer. There is a vetting process. You must complete the vetting process. Well, you know, I, I'm already a bishop, but that's not what you asked me about. You asked me about family life. So if you're a bishop, then why are we having this conversation? But if you want to be a bishop in the Family Life International Fellowship, you've got to go through this vetting. And if you go through this vetting, and you satisfy all of the requirements of this vetting process, you'll be able to stand up anywhere in the world and be recognized as a bishop who has been indeed tested and approved. Yeah. That's, that's how it works. That's how it works. So, uh, we're part of a, a number of different operations and organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I tell you up front, now there are others who are beginning to use this same system. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. Because God did not give us this to keep to ourselves. Exactly. If we're going to help the body, the body grow, then we have to share those things God has given to us. And with those individuals who are sincere about receiving. Yes, now, we don't cast pearls or swine. Amen. That's not the way that works. But we do make certain that information and, and processes are, are available. So, if you think about this credibility question, how would the people be, believe that you have said me? How, how would they believe who I, that I am who I said I am and that, that who, who you are is really who you are? How would, you, how would they believe that? Uh, and, and then, by the way, and even if they do believe that, how would they even believe that you sent me? I mean, I'm just out here on the, on the mountainside. I'd have I'd kill somebody, you know, and I'd run away. And here I am out here. And, and I'm, so how, how are they going to believe that? Look what God answers this thing in, in uh, verse number, uh, let's go look at verse number two and four. Two, three, and four of that same fourth chapter. The Lord said to him, that's, that's where I am. 
Then the Lord asked him, What do you have there in your hand? A shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Throw it down on the ground, the Lord told him. So Moses threw it down, and it became a snake. Moses was terrified, so he turned and ran away. Then the Lord told him, Take hold of its tail. So Moses reached out and grabbed it, and it became a shepherd's staff again. Skip to verse 6, and do 6 and 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, Put your hand inside your robe. Moses did so, and when he took it out again, his hand was white as snow with leprosy. Now put your hand back into your robe again, the Lord said. Moses did, and when he took it out this time, it was as healthy as the rest of his body. And then finally look at verse number 9. Read that. And if they do not believe you, even after these two signs, then take some water from the Nile River and pour it out on the dry ground. When you do, it will turn into blood. See, God is able to demonstrate his word, will, and way, if you will, to be the instrument that he will use to demonstrate through it. Uh, just Sunday, I believe, mean, we're talking about a number of things, but we're talking about moving mountains. And uh, I was trying to give an example of how certain mountains, if you're going to move them, you must believe without any doubt that God is not only able to do it, but will do it. And if you can't get to the will do it part, at least you must believe that he's able to do it and that you trust that he will do it. And in the midst of that, that prompted me to, to remind folk, God can heal cancer. And everybody's afraid of cancer. People fear it like it, it's, it is a plague. Yeah. And I, but my, but, and, and this was a part of the script, but what I was prompted to tell the people is that God can heal cancer. I know it because I, I was a, a, a cancer patient. Yeah. God healed me of cancer. Yeah. Yes, sir. And look, I didn't get a bunch of treatments for it. They found it looking for something else. Yeah. Yes, sir. You see? Yeah. So I know that God is able to do it. So when I stand up and tell you that God is able to do it, yes, sir. I'm, not, I'm not talking about something I heard. Yeah. I'm telling you what God did for me. Yeah. Yeah. Now look, I watched them wheel my son yeah. into a room. Yeah. And he was ripping with cancer. Uh -huh. And I watched him come out and go get healed. Uh, uh, wounds healed up, cancer free. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so, so this is something. Back and 
saying that you have this credibility. So that this is what God was showing you. And, and then, then Moses then went a different direction. He said, but I don't have a skill. I don't have the ability. I don't have the talent to do this. No, I'm, I'm serious. He says right here in verse number 10. Read verse 10 in that fourth chapter. When Moses replied to the Lord, Please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently, or since you have been speaking to your servant, because I'm slow and hesitant in speech. I, I'm, not, I'm not eloquent. Mm -hmm. I can't articulate like others. I, I'm, 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 I, I'm slow in speech. I stutter, perhaps. Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I have to think long and hard before the next word comes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm slow in speaking. Yeah. Now, now notice how God answers this. I just think this is so beautiful. Look at verse 11. <laughs> Yahweh said to him, who made the human mouth? <laughs> who makes him mute or deaf? Clean or blind? Is it not I? <laughs> Yahweh so, I, the I am, I am the one who made yes. your mouth. Yes. Don't tell me what you can't do with your mouth. I made okay, it. I made your mouth. You can do with your mouth whatever I tell you. <laughs> you know, don't tell me what you ain't done. I tell you what to right. So uh, If I say you can do it, you can do it. But I've never done it before. What that got to do with it? Right. Anyway, I just said, I go oh, ahead. I didn't plan to go with it, but you just you got me excited. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I appreciate it when you take us. Uh, we're, it's, it's a break time. Are we ready to eat? No, sir. Uh, what is the problem? Apparently, there was a miscommunication on my part. My team, I just spoke with them, understood to have everything ready for the morning. For the morning? Yes. I see. But you are the, you are the leader. You're the yeah, this is this. <laughs> Alright, well then we're gonna go somewhere and get something to eat. We go up to uh let's go up to the golden corral. Alright. We need to eat until we blew the face. Uh, Bishop Bingo. Hey, pronounce your last name. Sorry. Pronounce your last name. E E E E Bingo. E Bimbo and E Bimbo. 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 Is that evil? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, are you all hungry? What is it? Are you hungry? I know I'm hungry. What about you? Yeah, I'm hungry. You mean you're lying? I'm hungry. Well, we're going to go get something to eat. You, know, you guys don't want to go and get anything to eat? Uh, no, man. You want that song? Oh, he's just going to eat already. Uh, Oh, that's how come I was going to get him back here. That was not the plan. All right, so this guy is blown it twice. All right, he, he messed up on the coordination of that meal here and blew the schedule by feeding you first.
process until 7 